I make it kind of 11 o'clock, which is the kind of start of uh, start time for for, for this uh, Coburn uh, part day conference or, or Coburn conversation uh, of the title By Leaves We Live, Seeding Grassroots Climate Strategies in Edinburgh. Uh, and it's a really kind of exciting kind of program we actually have of, of three uh, panel sessions followed by kind of a plenary session. Um, <clears throat> so uh, just a few little housekeeping kind of message. This is a webinar package. I'd ask those panelists who are coming in kind of a bit later if they could certainly kind of keep themselves muted and video cameras kind of off. Um, and if DJ, you could shift them off and do other places too. That just kind of helps the, the kind of procession uh, uh, and the kind of activities going forward. Um, I'd first like to kind of log my thanks to Museums and Gallery Scotland for providing support for us to, to kind of put this event on. And if in any of the kind of attendees who, who are going to be kind of kind of entering in um, kind of wish to, to tweet about this or share a post on Facebook, please do uh, note that the two uh, conference tags we have is at the Coburn, which is the Coburn Association's tag, and hashtag COP26 conversations, um, which is the kind of wider MGS um, one for the sport for, for this, this event. Um, Q&A, uh, we, we hope to be able to have some opportunity to, to kind of take questions or, or kind of comments, uh, although I think the kind of timing is going to be very, very tight. But please do using the function tab at the kind of bottom of the kind of Zoom invite in the Q&A function, do certainly kind of put any questions or observations you have in that. And even if we don't get a chance to kind of address it in live session um, uh, at the moment, then, then, then please do uh, put them in and we'll pick up any kind of answers in the kind of uh, conference report that we'll be producing shortly after this. Um, and finally, it's just kind of worth noting that we are now recording kind of this, this um, event by News We Live and is being broadcast live on Facebook Live uh, off the Coburn Association pages as well. So with that little bit of, bit of housekeeping out of the way, uh, let's get right into the kind of, kind of first session um, and invite uh, our kind of chair panelist, Mariana Trusson, to kind of kick off affairs. Mariana is a chartered engineer, um, has lectured and kind of written extensively about sustainable building kind of systems. Um, most importantly, is a trustee of the Coburn Association. Uh, Mariana, over to you to kind of introduce all the other panelists too. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Terry. Um, and thank you to um, Petra, uh, James and Alice for joining us today. I'd like to start by um, introducing Petra and uh, to say that, you know, she, she is the CEO of Oh my goodness, Planning Aid Scotland, which I have gone to so many times for reference and information in my professional life. Um, and also um, she established the campaign to reopen the border railway line. And Petra, I absolutely loved, as I say, the speed guide that there is, is there on the pass. And oh my goodness, I'm going to ask you a little bit about it in, in a second, only to say that I think it's one of the uh, most important tools that people can use at the moment to get traction for things that they could do perhaps for um, climate change um, as we go forward. Um, I'll, I'll quickly go on to um, introducing Alice Haig, who is with us today as well, only because that's how you show up on my on my screen, by the way. Um, I'll go and introduce you to Alice Haig. Um, and she is an environmental social scientist in the social economic and geographical SEGS studies at um, James Hutton Institute. Again, I love that. I love that. And I cannot wait to eventually get to your book. I'm sorry, I do have a pile of books, <laughs> but I saw it and, and Grounded in Community. I know it came out recently um, and I'd like to get a chance to read it. And I hope, fingers crossed in my holidays. Um, and and I think that that is an excellent 
um, also a tool that could be used again for us going forward as we talk about how things have been in the past. And obviously, and again, James, Gary, oh my goodness, James has been with the Coburn for so long, but he's also such a, a good influence within the planning department and amazingly has had such a career um, and influenced uh, a number of planning and a number of sort of development aspects within um, councils and local government within Scotland. So I am so excited to see you all here today and thank you. I would like to sort of start by asking um, a general question and then as you answer, um, try and also sort of introduce yourselves as well. So, so Petra, I'll start again with you. What do you think, you know, what strategies do you think? Because this is all about um, Local Agenda 21. What strategies do you think since, the, since that started have actually helped and have moved us forward locally? And what do you think haven't um, of the ones that we've seen and so on? Thank you very much. Um, quite, a, quite a comprehensive question. I might start by just explaining a little bit my own background. Uh, it's now 30 years ago since I did my master's in environmental management and audit in Glasgow. And that just shows how long ago we have had these discussions. And I've reflected a little bit on it because I, my first job thereafter was in uh, environmental campaigning and then I moved to local agenda 21. And I reflected that this is a really good opportunity to reflect why haven't we gone further in 30 years? And I think very much when I took on initially in the Scottish Borders and then with COSLA, Local Agenda 21 was not with the Chief Executive's Office. It was in environmental waste or planning. Not that, that the colleagues weren't fantastic, but it didn't connect the different policy agendas. And that's what we have to uh, really, really try and uh, minimize going forward. We can only we can only do it if we take it out of the environmental box, but really call it sustainability in its widest sense and team up all the um, all the different um, policy arenas. It has to work across. It has to work across environment. Has to work across uh, planning. Has to work across transport, health, and we're now seeing that slowly happening. There's a wider awareness that sustainability is not just put in one box. And I give you an example later on, if I may. And I haven't answered your question, have I? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you may have done because you just said that, 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 you know, it might have not moved so long for that reason. Yeah. Thank you. Alice? Hi. Um, yeah, so again, a bit about my background. So I'm an environmental social scientist and I'm really interested in how communities engage um, with climate change, what, acti what activities they take. And actually, I kind of got here a long way around by virtue of, I used to work for the Foreign Office, used to be a civil servant, and about 12 years ago it was, um, Paris, no, not Paris, sorry, Copenhagen year, the last great hope for kind of COP15, I think that was. Um, I was involved in some of the kind of intergovernmental level of discussions, and I I found it quite frustrating at that time just how divorced from reality of where we live um, some of those discussions were and so I think that's how I then turned to look at more um, local level things um, and in particular some of the some of the aspects over the last few years the Scottish government um, through Keep Scotland Beautiful has you know supported a lot of community level initiatives on climate change um, really I think both in terms of like energy efficiency and helping people think about what it means to do kind of local food growth and things. Um, but I think through that, they've also stimulated conversations at a much more local level about what climate change means and what actions um, people can take, you know, with their neighbors, with their community groups. Um, and, and so I know that the Climate Challenge Fund is changing into other things, but I think there's a lot of good local level action. I've, I've got criticisms of it, don't get me wrong, but there is a lot of, there's a groundswell of engagement, which I think um, can really help us take action, take steps um, to kind of broaden the message and broaden engagement. And I think a conference like this, connecting different people and opening avenues to new connections and sharing knowledge um, is the kind of thing that fills me with hope um, for where we go next. 
Thank you. James? Well, I, actually, um, well, I, I've worked in, in, in Edinburgh and I've worked in several other local authorities and for um, various public bodies over the years. But what um, Alice and Petra have just said is really very interesting because I've been reflecting about my experience of working in Edinburgh. I came back um, to work in Edinburgh in the early 90s and uh, 93. And at that time, the old regional council and the old district council were both working on their own versions of LA21 strategies, sustainable development strategies. But, um, you know, it's, it's a long time ago, but my, my impression was that the officers working on those were very much working in silos. They were essentially um, environmental strategies. They were um, written by small sustainable development units, which were really somewhat divorced from the reality of what the, the, the two councils were doing. And um, those glossy strategies when they came out, no doubt were launched in a, in a big public way. Um, but, but of course they've, they've disappeared from the from the public arena now. They may well be in some archives somewhere, but they were the first strategies I remember of a whole series of strategy policy and action plan type documents that have emerged almost every year since then. Um, going forward a wee bit in time towards the end of, of the 90s, 98, when I was one of the people who were um, interviewed by the really quite um, ambitious Lord Provost Commission on, on Sustainable Development, and um, we might want to come back to, uh, to that. Um, I was asked, well, what are the barriers to, 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 to communities being involved in, in sustainable development? It was really about sustainable development in, in a broader sense, rather than climate change in those days, although the climate change agenda had begun to emerge. So what were the barriers? And I think I said, well, information and access to, to, to resources, money, but other resources as well. And uh, Alice has mentioned the, the, the Climate Challenge Fund, and I think that is an example of where information and, and, and resources have been made available, albeit in um, you know, a limited way for a limited time, and that has resulted in, in local communities being able to take action to, to resolve lo um, local issues uh, and to build towards a more climate-ready community and build towards a more sustainable community. And in the case of Edinburgh, um, there's, there's been quite a lot of climate challenge fund activity and some of that activity has resulted in, in permanent changes in permanent organizations in permanent initiatives which are as we speak contributing towards a, a more sustainable Edinburgh. So lessons for the past are relevant today um, uh, um, going, uh, and, and, uh, and are relevant to the, the future as well. Thank you. So Apologies. It seems that it seems that this uh, divorce, right, this distance between where where decisions are made at the high level, um, and where work is done for sustainability in a silo seems to be a a, a theme here. Petra, you said that you had something to say about that. Uh, you had a little bit more detail to go into. Yes, I think obviously um, the mantra that we that the, the the, the most critical is uh, think global, act local. And I'm very much uh, sort of into the behavioral change agenda. We can have all the technological fixes, but unless we're actually changing behaviors and that has to come from within human beings themselves, we can't just always top down. So I'll give you an example of what uh, we've done at Link Group. I uh, chair the recently convened uh, subcommittee on sustainability. So we've taken our, um, what you call it, the um, business plan, and we made it in our, into our sustainability plan. So that means it goes across all, all the different functions. We recently became the first housing association to uh, get an accredited, the Ritterbell accreditation, environmental accreditation, and we're working now through it. But for me, the key here will be how we engage best with our tenants at all ages because they will have to be brought in to understanding the wider agenda. So it's not top down, it really has to. And that means we'll have to now go forward, listening, engaging, and also listening to what kind of um, solutions they may come up with. There's lots of uh, interesting 
solutions out in the community. And it doesn't always have to have money thrown at it. It's actually really interesting just to listen and to learn to listen. That. So that's really drives my, my thinking. And also in the past, uh, recently we finished a very interesting um, um, project called Sustaining Choices, where we worked in seven uh, more deprived communities to try and endeavor modal shift from you know, buses and cars to actually cycling. And we did that by engaging community activists themselves rather than us, again, parachuting in. And I think that has then, that leaves traction and I'm very happy the, the report of that and will be shortly available. And hopefully we're moving on to the second stage. But there's a lot of uh, things we can do if we really go and pay homage to what Patrick Geddes has always done. And he made those connections. I mean, in past, we are very active on uh, place work folk that inspires us as, a, as an organization. But within that, we also have been working by Leaves We Live, where we work with the planning professionals and artists together with communities to try and bring that to life. What would it look like now? So I'm still inspired very much by Patrick Geddes and uh, I may continue. Thank you. Indeed. Alice, there's, a, there's, there's um, a theme also here that seems to be coming out from what Petra was saying about almost championing, right? Having, having an idea and finding local on the ground champions to sort of help you promote that, isn't it? Have you had any such experiences? I think, yeah, I think that's one of the great opportunities in some way in that it, it, it sometimes just needs one person with a good idea and they can you know, engage and bring others along. But I think that's also one of the challenges for some of this area um, in that it can feel quite lonely, quite hard work. And if one person moves away or you know, has to cut down their involvement for whatever, suddenly initiatives can kind of stutter. Um, and so that's where I, I think one of the things we find is when we talk about kind of climate action at the local level, it's not just about the climate actions you're taking, it's about the connection, it's about the social aspects. It's, about building a group, you know, the, the kind of sense of community. Um, and I certainly got that sense kind of talking to people. There's a group um, on the Meadows in Edinburgh who I was involved with a few years ago. I, um, when I lived there, I actually have moved away now. Um, but they started off by asking the council green space officer, you know, can, can we put a little bit of wildflower area on the Meadows? Which is obviously for those who, well, hopefully most people here know Edinburgh, but that kind of huge green space. And it started off with a, a tiny patch of um, wildflower. Um, and, and again, essentially about the initiative of one person kind of taking up the initiative, taking the contact, building a few connections, letting, you know, talking to people when they were out and they've now got a little community garden going, they've got a little kind of orchards and trees. And it's still small scale, but it's a way that people have tangible connection, a way that people say, we want things to be a little bit different in the way we, we've worked over, over the past however many years. Um, and yeah, it, it's it's driven by one person, but now um, going much broader and bringing in other, others in the neighborhood and, and inspiring people through that. So, you know, we need our champions, but also we need to support our champions and be out there and, you know, championing our champions almost. I, and, and almost it sounds as if it's a case of also you have these champions, you, you get the momentum and you also, as you say, want someone else there to almost be a little bit of a support when things go down. Right. And, and things get a little bit difficult. Exactly. Someone to be there on a wet Saturday afternoon on the meadows and actually kind of say, you know, we'll do what we said we'll do. And then let's go and get a coffee because it's cold. Um, but, yeah, something to build that sense of it's not just me. Um, but also to empower people about, but I can make a difference where, where I am. I see. And, and, and James, what do you think? Do you think um, the, the likes of local community councils, perhaps, are they those, those support networks? Um, well, well, I think there's no simple answer to, to, to that particular question for some communities in some places, um, community councils, for example, um, are really very proactive. But in other communities across Edinburgh, it's been different sorts of, of partnership bodies and charity, charitable bodies, local trusts that have really diff, driven uh, the, the local sustainable development and, and climate change agenda. Um, I was thinking also of um, 
I, I originally came back to work in Edinburgh and Craig Miller and my um, the most successful large scale environmental project that I was involved in was the, the Craig Miller Urban Forest Project. If you go to Craig Miller now, uh, a lot of the trees you see uh, around um, the Craig Miller Castle and, and, and school grounds uh, and parks um, are, are, were part of the Craig Miller Urban Forest, which in a sense grew to the wider Edinburgh Urban Forest. And that was made possible um, by um, local people, local community organisations getting engaged with uh, a national initiative, uh, the Millennium Forest for Scotland Trust initiative, which planted you know, many, many, many hectares of native trees across Scotland. I was a, for a time a trustee with them. Um, but that provided a framework for local people in Craig Miller, all local people, organisations, lots and lots of children to get involved in a very, very practical way uh, to, to change their local environment. And, and, and their local environment is physically changed now because of that project. But it also was a fun, a fun thing. One of the you know, most exciting things about that particular project was the Craig Miller plant -a -thon which was a, a, a big, big um, weekend long initiative to plant trees round about Craig Miller Castle. And that, that drew in people, not just from Craig Miller, but from the whole of Edinburgh and indeed the whole of Scotland. Um, it, was, it was very, very big uh, for a very short time, but it's just, it, was just, it was just facilitated by a, a national programme with uh, local coordination from community organisations organizations like the one I worked for and um, again paid for ultimately by the council and the Scottish government and also facilitated and supported by local council officers and we shouldn't forget how important it is when we talk about the community councils when we talk about Edinburgh communities how important the role of the council is and the council the, the support that um, various initiatives and officers directly or indirectly and linked to the council are in environmental activities of all kinds. But that was my, 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 my biggest success um, in terms of getting local people together to do something as a community that, that has resulted in a positive physical change. Thank you. And, and it is a very difficult and complex system because it is obviously a system for humans and we are complex, I think. <laughs> Add that to the sustainability bitty of it and then we're all all over the place and I, and, and I, and I see that that's coming through. Um, I, I will open this to all three of you and then I'll stay quiet and see how you, because I've done the, the, the one, in a, one in a row, but I think, what do you think? Understanding what hasn't worked or the frustration that, you know, 30, 35 years now, nothing has happened. Um, what action do you think, what, what one action do you think would give this round of let's do something, this round of, of strategy, what would you think would give it a good kick to get things going properly? I've had a, a bit of thinking around, and we have actually in Scotland, we have a really good um, opportunity at the moment because we're having, we're about to get a new planning system. We are talking about 20 million neighborhoods within that. We're talking about local place plan, which has always been missing, i.e. the decision-making was far too remote from people. Now that people are empowered to actually create local place plan, we don't know yet the full extent of it and how much they're going to be aligned to, Look to development plans, but we know there's an opportunity now to start really acting local, as it was said by Patrick Geddes, and think global as we are moving into National Planning Framework 4, which of course is for the first time going to be discussed in the whole of Scottish government, not just in the subcommittee. So the plan for Scotland, the MPF4, is actually going to be really vital. And if it's voted on by the parliamentarian, it has that national structure. And within that, you have cascading up from the from the local what local people would like to see what they would like to have and bearing in mind that now for the first time we're also linking young people's voices in that so there's a democratic deficit that has been missing for too long so i think whilst i've started off quite sort of pessimistic what happened why has so little happened i'm also seeing some sort of shoots of green appearing that could actually really make a difference 
So that's all. Thank you. I, I think um, I would um, rerun a, a version of the Lord Provost's Commission on Sustainable Development. I think that commission that, that commission was incredibly ambitious in what it set out to do, which was really in, in a general in general sense to answer the question: How can Edinburgh continue to grow but in a sustainable way? Uh, and the, the Coburn Association was one of the very few organisations to say that in fact there's a fundamental difference between sustaining growth and, and sustainable growth. So I think the the the, the original. Commission failed partly or largely because it didn't recognise that fact. And um, where we are now uh, is, in a, is in a somewhat different place. But if we re reran the, the Lord Provost Commission, we could begin to get some of those unrepresented or underrepresented voices today. The, the, the young of the city, um, the, 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 the young professionals, those people who, and, uh, who, who themselves or their children are going to be around to very much deal with the consequences of our inability as a community, as a world community, to take the level of action required and at the pace required to ensure that we have a sustainable future going forward. So I would rerun the mission and make sure that um, this time, and I'm not sure that it was entirely achieved last time, this time, the voices of Edinburgh's local communities, local professionals, local communities, community workers, and ordinary residents who have got the most to gain and the most to lose are represented, their voices are represented on that commission. Uh, and also um, in every aspect of their lives, not just environmental aspects, social aspects, and the economic aspects together. It's all part or one whole. And when we discuss the um, climate change, when we discuss the, the sustainable development, um, it's so easy to fall back into our comfortable little silos. The Lord Provost Commission tried to break through that, I'm not sure it did, um, but we, if we rerun it now, we can try extremely hard to make sure that we talk in the round about what it means to, to, to create a, a, sustain, a sustainable Edinburgh going forward. Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, asking what one thing can be done is a um, big, big question, big ask. Um, but I think just picking up on what James was saying there about the sustainable, you know, it's not just about the sustainability thing, it's about economics, it's about social conditions. And, and I actually think that is almost part of the wider discourse now that's changing. I think particularly younger generations, um, it's all interconnected in a way that maybe for you know, some of us, it was kind of, there was, as you say, there was the environment team in the council who um, did things. I know up in Aberdeenshire, the sustainability, sustainability people, it's plural, um, are based in the economic development team. And, and I think into integrating more holistically thoughts of, um, you know, social conditions, thoughts of economic situations, you know, rather than economic growth, but I, I think somehow tying all that together in, in a coherent manner. And sometimes that might mean, I, I know again, sir, I've been doing some research in Aberdeenshire recently, that they have, a, they have a carbon budget. Each department has a carbon budget as much as they have a financial budget. Um, and that's only been a few years, but it, it's, it's starting to require change. You know, it's requiring a change in thinking um, about how everybody does their work. And, and I think things like that, where we can mainstream climate so it's not climate it's not just the eco warriors um but that it's actually um part of everything we're about and, and i say I, I do think that's where um younger generations are i do think that's where um you know people who've been through the universities in the last 10 years are i think it is so integrated and i think that's actually an opportunity um as, as, as we move forward more broadly thank you for that a number of questions have been coming in. I don't know if you can see it. One is um, from Simon Hollidge. If we are going to make genuine progress in reducing carbon emissions, um, does that imply major changes to the structure of local government? So, for example, Edinburgh centralised at one level, whereas the cities like Copenhagen, 
much is done at district level equivalent perhaps to Edinburgh City Wards. Um, what does the panel think? It's always very difficult. Petra, apologies, you seem to have muted again. Yeah, sorry, is that better? Yeah, sorry, I was just thinking there's always a challenge when you compare different countries because they have different political systems. And most uh, European countries, municipalities are much, much lower and much more connected. So on, on average, we have in the UK 120,000 uh, people per local government. On the continent, it's uh, 3,000 to 5,000 people per municipality who have their own budget. And so, of course, the decision making is much more localized. So if we want to change, we have to really look at all the changes, not just one thing and saying, OK, we've got to do away with slow government. I think this is a very, very, perhaps quite an overdue discussion to be had at, um, at national level. Yes. So I leave it there, otherwise it becomes political. <laughs> I'll just build on that as well. I think one of the things, again, sorry to draw another example from up north, um, Aberdeenshire is such a big area. And, you know, again, to have centralised decision making around all these different areas, and I think Edinburgh is the same. It's a big area. There's going to be different challenges on climate change, whether we're talking about adaptation or, um, you know, kind of adapting to the effects. What, who's, who, what are the communities who are most at risk of flooding? There are going to be different challenges. Um, and I think there's got to be some way of, again, empowering people. And the community councils have a role, but I think it needs to go beyond that. I think we, we have learned so much recently about much many more participatory approaches, about um, things like citizen ju juries, kind of bringing people together to learn about and wrestle with some of the challenges and, and to recognize there's gonna have to be trade-offs. And some of those trade-offs are gonna, um, mean changes to our ways of life it's the behavior thing that Petra was talking about and you know our, our actions um so yes again I, I think I, I would kind of back up Petra and saying yes it's a different context different politics but also actually some way of making meaningful um that that kind of community voice I mean this this is quite a difficult question in, in many respects uh, in, in one sense, the fact that um, climate change action is often um, structured around the interests of particular councils or particular local authorities is, I think, has been and it continues to be um, a, a, a hindrance. So, for example, and in particular, if you are living in South Edinburgh, your particular climate change um, priority might well be the exactly the same climate change priority to your neighbours who happen to live in Midlothian just across the road, but there may well be structural um, uh, and, and financial um, uh, and uh, council officer impediments to working together as 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 a a, a, a a community of a particular locality. So we have to somehow going forward begin to think out of the local authority box. Um, because that those boxes uh, can, in very many cases, restrict action and um, restrict the effectiveness of, of the local communities to place in doing something very positive in, in their own communities and in their own lives. Thank you. This is very interesting. <laughs> um, we've got another um, question from David Somerville. Um, the ask from the school climate strikes or Fridays for Future is for system change, not climate change. Which aspects of the social and political and economic system do the panel think could and should be changed? See, we're, we're gone into politics, Petra. We said that we wouldn't, but we have to. Well, I think I can say I think everything's politics, isn't it? <laughs> Um, yeah. No, I, I think I think that's a really good question. Um, and for me, I think it comes that there it comes to saying that we will have to change things about how we live um, and some of our comforts. Um, and this is where again I think Edinburgh has such a fantastic public transport system, but it can be better. Um, but I think it, it's actually holding you know things like holding 
using public transport, you know, many people doing it again, many people in Edinburgh don't own cars, which is so unusual elsewhere. Um, but, but I think there's things about how can we, you know, commit to not flying within the UK, which might seem a kind of simple throwaway, but I'm up north and everything takes long, you know, travel distances are hard. Um, but actually somewhere like Edinburgh is, is very accessible, is very well served. And so supporting that, but also asking questions, you know, when you next need a new car, do you need a new car? Do you need two cars? Um, actually, you know, electric bikes, electric cargo bikes for kind of delivery businesses. I think there's lots of initiatives taking place in transport that will require that behavior change in what we've been used to for the last 40 or so years. Um, but again, which a city like Edinburgh, which is so compact, has the opportunity um, to keep doing well. So there's already already uh, a lot of the solutions are already known, and David is actually in the forefront of one of them, which are, is called co-housing, which, uh, David, I hope it's going well. And that's really looking at how we can repurpose some of the existing housing stock to actually make sure that um, people who share similar values can come together. And we don't do enough of that. It's been coming, it's going, been said and said and said, but nothing has happened. Um, as going back to um, what's happening right now in our building stock environment, we have a lot of empty homes. And I was looking yesterday, I was uh, on Princess Street and I thought, thought, wouldn't it be lovely if we had the old buildings like Debenhams or Jenna's repurposed for housing association houses? We can do that. People could walk. They don't have to. They don't have to drive. And I don't understand why the solution is staring us. And these houses are, we're working with a number of community groups across Scotland in smaller towns and villages and looking at their, how they can repurpose some of their uh, empty buildings that are often central to the fabric because there used to be a bank or a co-op shop and whatever. And also, I think it isn't always a big science. It's about if you put human beings first, you have cause and effect. And if you put them, if you start with human beings, then you, the, the answers will actually flow from that because you're putting people first rather than to, you know, to technical solutions. And I think that's really, really important. So if you purpose a building and you give it to housing associations or housing tenants or people on a lower income, they wouldn't have to spend an extraordinary amount to get to a place where they work or where they... So I, I think the solutions are all out there. I can give you a list of them if you like. <laughs> I was reflecting back on um, again on the 90s and, and what happened then and what worked and what didn't work. But um, I, I'd forgotten that in the mid 90s, the, the, the then new city of Edinburgh Council was the first local authority to sign the, um, the local authority climate change uh, resolution, which I think was actually a Friends of the Earth um, initiative, which is interesting in itself, actually. So the council signed a resolution and on the back of that, that, that resolution a number of very local targets were set uh, one of which happens to be a uh, happened to be a, a car target I've, I've written it down um, so car usage was met, was targeted to drop by 30 percent by by 2010 and there was one about carbon emissions and of course the the the, the ambition to become the most sustainable um, city in Northern Europe or something like that by, by 2015 also emerged. So those you, you've got there the signing of a resolution, a charter, a commitment. You've got the setting of targets which may or may not have been met. Most of them weren't met. Uh, and what, we do, what are we doing today? We're, we're signing, the city is just against the first council to sign the new um, uh, uh, civic charter um, developed by um, the Scotland's Climate Assembly. We're setting all sorts of carbon reduction targets. And um, is that, so I, I pose not a, an answer, but a question, is our action in tackling climate, is it all about signing documents and setting targets or are we actually achieving anything on the ground and what are we achieving and um, are we doing it well so it would be inaccurate to say that there is no activity on the ground and that nothing has changed and that nothing is being achieved but could we and should we be doing more 
and should we be doing it faster and should we be doing it better? And the answer to those questions, I very much feel is, is yes. I don't think we're doing enough. And I don't think we're doing it fast enough. And I don't think it's reaching uh, and improving the lives and well-being of enough people in the city. I'd just like to add to that. And when we, when we ever talk about the local, i.e. Edinburgh, we also have to think about the impact globally, because at the moment, I know there's a big push for electric this and electric that, but these, these minerals are mined in one of the poorest countries in the world. And there's huge amount of displacement taking place. So again, let's not forget the impact on a global scale that we have and in the local or in the, in the UK. We really need to be mindful of cause and effect. Well, there's just one thing I'd like to ask, add to Petra. I've, I've already seen our need for uh, rare earths being used mm -hmm. as a, a, an excuse for, for um, my deep sea mining. So again, that might well be an example of where our, our attempts to solve one global environmental crisis simply generates something which is as bad, if not even worse. So we, we, are, we are talking about Edinburgh, but Edinburgh is part of Scotland, Scotland is part of the world. Yeah. We, we are all global citizens. Absolutely, and that's how we, our mindset has to be like that, yeah. Thank you very much um, for we've got three more minutes left. And so I was thinking, um, as this is a Coburn Association meeting, um, what do you think that the Coburn, how do you think that the Coburn can help um, push some of these aspects forward more than it is at the moment? Or do you think that it's doing as much as it can within what we what we have well I'll, I'll perhaps start the same the first to actually works for the Coburn um, I think the Coburn's over its quite a surprisingly long history we are we are one of the oldest organizations in the world really of, of our kind um, the Coburn's always been at best when it when it's been at campaigning when it's campaigning for us uh, in the context of a, a local crisis. Um, one of our biggest and best campaigns of, of, in, in the early days involved um, Brunsfield and, and trees in Brunsfield. That's partly our role to um, bring together the voices of residents across the city and to, to, to facilitate the, their, their, their voices within uh, the, the general discourse of the city about the issues of the moment. And so um, our challenge as an organisation, I think, going forward, particularly in terms of climate change and climate change activism, um, is, is to find a way of representing our members and our um, stakeholders, which are, we've got a lot of stakeholders, um, in, in that debate across the city. It's a very crowded debate. There are lots and lots of climate change activists, lots and lots of climate change orientated organisations. Um, and I do worry that um, increasingly we're all just talking to each other and we're not actually talking to or for or on behalf of the wider community. Way back in the 90s, I, 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 the, 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 the residents of the city were surveyed and asked about sustainable development. They were asked if they knew about sustainable de development and they cared about sustainable development. And city, 70 or so percent of the residents surveyed said no. If you ask residents now if they care about climate change, if they know about cl um, climate change, if they're concerned about climate change, 50 or so percent of residents will say no. So, you know, something's failed somewhere. Um, there's a challenge for organisations like ours to, to give that 50 percent an opportunity to have a voice, to have a means of participation. I don't have an answer to how we do it, but I think it's a crying need. I think I'll, I'll just add on that. I agree. It, it's absolutely that there's a, you know there is a need, and I think the Coburn is 
in some ways it, it's got this position that speaks for the whole of Edinburgh. And, and I think also just the knowledge and the expertise, you know, within the people here today, within the wider Coburn Association. Um, and I, I do still say, you know, we're talking a lot about community initiatives, but there is still a place for speaking into national level consultations and Edinburgh consultations and, and the opportunity to bring that expertise together on behalf of the citizens of Edinburgh, whether they're in, you know, Brunsfield, Morningside or the north of town or, you know, it, it, it's representing the whole of the city, um, but doing that well. And I say speaking into the higher decision making powers that are there as well, and as well as, at, you know, active at the local level. Yeah, so I just would add, um, what can the Coburn Association do? I think it can reach out more to people across Edinburgh, whether they live in New Haven or whether they live in Wester Hills. It's that umbrella, because I think there is a, always a, um, and I'm a member, but um, there is this association a little bit like, oh, it's very re re um, reactive rather than proactive. And I think that's probably one of the biggest change. You have that depth and that, culture and that tradition and you are the embodiment of uh, Patrick Geddes and you know the the idea of think global act local should really be in everybody's I'm still amazed how few people in Scotland actually know of Patrick Geddes and that is just not good enough and we're doing certainly our best to help but it needs to reach beyond uh, that membership it needs to go to all residents and guess the other thing and of all ages and the other thing I would say is just on a practical level, perhaps lend your voice to repurposing building empty building stock in, in Edinburgh and do it in such a way that it really benefits those most in need. Yeah, that's, I think, all. Thank you very much. It has been a very interesting conversation. I understand that our time might be up according to my uh, to my little schedule so there is terry again as if by magic <laughs> i'll pass over to you terry thank you very much um mariana for a really fascinating uh, discussion um and thanks to the, the you know all the panelists for for kicking off this um conversation um about by leaves we live what are those grassroots strategies that can actually make the global strategies kind of, kind of work for for edinburgh um, so what we'll do is we will take a, a brief break now, um, and so we can have a little comfort stop and go look at some object in, in the distance to allow the eyes to kind of refocus. Um, and we will reconvene um, just before 12 o'clock to kick off at 12 o'clock sharply for our next uh, kind of panel discussion, which is on the subject of building neighborhood resilience in Edinburgh, um, trees, treescape, streetscape and landscape as being uh, opportunities um, for, for local initiatives going forward. So, um, Marianne, thank you very much for, for chairing the session. And Alice, James, Petra, thank you hugely for your kind of input. Please do just stick with us uh, if you can kind of over the day. Uh, as I said, we are recording this and putting it out live on, on Facebook. If you have any kind of thoughts, please do tweet them, put them out at the Coburn or hashtag COP26 uh, conversations. Um, we'd certainly like to, to hear your kind of views and see them kind of out in social media. Um, so we'll see you shortly. Thank you. <laughs>